last week we basically talked the goal of creation uh, and then the the main thing was the um, tension between the OT expectation you know the last days the OT expectation of the last days and the NT realization uh, and we realized that is caused largely by the mountain view of prophecy you know where prophecy is seen as a view by the prophet but he sees the two peaks that doesn't know that there is a big valley between the two peaks the first coming of christ and the second coming of christ and sometimes as that if you like see two mountains very hard to see which mountain the front and the back they both you know two snow capped mountains and they just look like one mountain sometimes you know so that view tended to uh, make the prophets describe things uh, in a in a way that in a sense uh, made the two comings of Christ quite. So really we have, uh, so Jesus spent 40 days talking about teaching them, I think, about the last days. And we know it comes this way, inauguration. When Christ came, the apostles and the Holy Spirit, and then the continuation, the church age, which we are in now, and then finally the consummation. Huh? So eschatology in the in the in the big picture now, huh? the last days is actually when Christ comes already. That's two thousand years ago, right? And we call that latter days or last days. Huh? And these are the three ages. Huh? So Christ coming with the apostles, then Holy Spirit comes, the church age, and finally Christ comes back general resurrection of the dead, judgment, destruction of the earth, creation of the new heaven, new earth, and all of us in glorified bodies in the new heaven and new earth. All right. Today we come to the topic of doctrine of eschatology, the living and the dead. All right. Next slide. This kind of eschatology is called individual eschatology. We're studying what, how individual human beings will experience the events of the last days. Not seeing it from a helicopter view, seeing it as individuals. Huh? All right, helicopter view, you see the last days having three stages, three ages, you know, inauguration, continuation, consummation. But as individuals, how would you as an individual experience the last days? Okay, let's look at. <clears throat> Next slide. Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, humanity's present condition. Uh, this is our present. It started off mm, long, long ago. Adam before the fall. He had the ability not to sin. Okay, he had that ability. God gave him ability. After the fall, we all have the inability not to sin <laughs> we are sinners by instinct sinners by by bent sinners by nature uh, and sinners by birth of course right so after the fall it's not ability not to sin it's inability not to sin can't help but sin but then if man gets regenerated or born again <clears throat> he has the ability again not to sin <laughs> Okay, but unlike Adam, his sinful flesh wars against his desire and ability not to sin. In other words, his flesh drags him into sin. You know, the word flesh is your own nature, you know. A lot of us are now born again believers, but we still think habitually about bad things. <laughs> That's the way, you know, habits are very hard to break. You get saved at 40 years old, you got a 40 year habit of lying, 40 year habit of lusting, 40 year habit of envying, <laughs> all right? Habits, you know, one week old habit sometimes hard to break, uh, one year old habit, let alone a, almost a lifelong. So right now we have the ability not to sin, but the flesh, the tendencies and habits of the flesh, war against that ability. So right now we have this 
condition, the last panel there, uh, all right? And one day we get to heaven, we have ability not to sin and no tendency to sin, and we have no ability to sin, <laughs> and we get the glorified body in heaven, all right? So that's uh, in the fourth panel, I'm not, not shown here yet. All right, next slide. All right, so we see the struggle of Apostle Paul writes this. So now it's no longer I who, say, uh, who do it, but sin that dwells within me. You know, that flesh, that nature, the war. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that's in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what keep, I keep on doing. So we, we, you and I can experience Paul experiences it. I experience it. We all experience it all the time. We want to do right. You know, but there's some tendency in our flesh, you know, to laziness, to lying, to, to all kinds of exaggerations, to pride. It's almost like it's a habit, you know, it's like a smoker picking up a cigarette, right? Next slide. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body is death? Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So I, then I myself serve the Lord, but my mind, but my flesh, I serve the law of Sin. All right, so you see that battle, huh? Next slide. Okay, now we come to this funny state called the intermediate state. Now, this is individual eschatology, so the terms that we don't that normally use. The intermediate state is the time between life on earth, you and me now, and life in the eternal state, the new heaven, new earth. So if I were to die today, PC dies today, I go into what I is called the intermediate state. It's a very funny state. It's intermediate only. I start, I go to heaven. My body lies in the grave, in the coffin. My spirit goes to be with God in heaven. It's a very funny state because it's the only time we'll not be in the body. God created us, body and soul, body and spirit. This funny time is abnormal, all right? That's why death is so scary in a sense. You're going to be separated from your body. And if you don't understand, a lot of people think that's heaven. You think that's the eternal state. Many, 90% of Christians think the intermediate state is the eternal state. I'm going to be in, in this spirit floating up there, all right? Okay? And that's terrible. That's horrible eschatology. All right, next slide. It's an unusual stage of life because of the separation of the body from the soul. It's freaky. It's weird. Man was not made to have a body separated from his spirit. All right? When God created man, body and spirit, God said, very good. And he separated the two. That's why death is such an abnormal condition. All right? All right? In this. Uh, all right. Next slide. The intermediate state is frightening. Okay, so now we come to two types of people. The unregenerate, the intermediate state, when they die, is frightening. While the sons of the kingdom, Jesus said this, will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Not much is described. It's called outer darkness. Where and all that, I don't know. I don't care, but I'm not going to go there anyway. All right? It's a place called outer darkness. That's what it's said. Huh? Next slide. So the word darkness, I understand. Outer, I don't know. <clears throat> In Jude 7, this is getting unregenerate, huh? Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality, pursued unnatural desires, serve an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Ouch. Right? So we know it's dark, there's fire, there's gnashing of teeth. Agony, all right? Next slide. <clears throat> <sighs> Jude 13, while waves, while waves the sea, cast into foam their own shame, wandering stars to whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved, reserved forever. So the darkness is total darkness. You know, people say, oh, I die, I can be my buddies, we can have a drinking party together, we can eat. There's no point being your buddies, you can't see them and you can't hear them except they're groaning and moaning and their pain, <clears throat> all right? As they, as they, you know, they, they suffer in hell. What, 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 
What's the point of being your buddies? Hear your buddies scream and they hear you scream. That's a lot of fun, all right? It's terrible, all right? So it's frightening, right? Just enough to frighten the sense out of anybody in the next life. Mm. The intermediate state is heavenly for the regenerate. Jesus said to the man on the cross, truly I say to you, today you'll be in the paradise. Mm. All right? Exactly what it is, it's paradise. Mm. Right? It's an intermediate state. Today, this poor guy will be crucified. And Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise. The intermediate state. His body was still hanging on the cross when he took his last breath. But he was with Jesus. Right? All right? He would be in paradise. Right? Mm. Next slide. The intermediates have leave up again. Yes, we are good courage and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So it's again that intermediate state, the separation of the body uh, and the spirit which is with the Lord. Okay, next one. Separation from the sin-cursed body frees the regenerate in heaven from the pull to sin. Now we say separation from the body is very weird, right? It's very horrible, right? It's a it's an unnatural state, but it's a one advantage. It frees you from the flesh, which is that struggle that Paul described in Romans chapter seven, the battle of the flesh and the and the desire to do right. Right? So let's read Hebrews 12. And to the assembly of the firstborn who enrolled in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. All right? So no more that drag of the flesh, the pull of the flesh to, 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 to lie and to look at another woman with lust and all those things. The tendency of the eye just to ding, your thoughts to uh, pride, you know, your tongue to uh, gossip. All those things are almost automatic uh, in the flesh things like but that's no more than in in the intermediate state for the regenerate all right so individual eschatology yeah huh? that's an intermediate state right when is the final or the consummation of the kingdom remember the consummation of the kingdom the first event is the resurrection general resurrection of everybody after that, the judgment. Huh? Okay, now. So, when Christ comes back, everybody will be resurrected. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So, this both sides is everlasting. One to something we call life. The other is something we call shame and contempt. It's life with shame and contempt and pain and everything and, and so on. Wow, this was was already predicted by Daniel a long, long ago, right? The rest, general resurrection. Next slide. Okay, the unregenerate also will be risen in their new bodies. Just like I will get my new body, they also have a new body. What's that body designed for? My body will be designed to enjoy the new heaven and new earth. Their bodies will be designed not to enjoy but to suffer. My body is designed to enjoy forever without getting old and dying the new heaven and new earth. That body is designed to suffer forever without dying, all right? Forever, all right? So they will be within their new bodies resurrected, this new body designed to suffer, and they will be at a great white throne judgment to be judged for the sins that they have done. All right? You and I will not be there. Why? Our sins are already settled by right, Jesus. All right? So what, what is there to be judged for our sins? Our sins were judged at the cross already. Right? So next slide. <clears throat> next slide. <clears throat> Revelation 20. Then I saw a great white throne. That's why I call it the great white throne judgment. And him who, seen, who was seated on it, from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. 
And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what is written in the books according to what they had done. The sea gave up the dead who were in their death, and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they would judge each of one of them according to what they had done. Next slide. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Right? Now, some people ask, well, is God in hell? The answer, of course, is yes. God's omnipresent. He's everywhere. But we say from the presence of the Lord, from the, they will not sense God. <laughs> right? They will not have, unlike you and me, in the new heaven and new earth. All right? We will have a, eternal presence and sense and possibly even some way we can fellowship and see God, right? Right. <clears throat> and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, was thrown into the lake of fire. Right. So this judgment doesn't bother us in the sense like it's not our issue, right? Okay. <clears throat> so that's a horrible uh, state of the unregenerate. Their bodies are designed Normally, fire burns and burns out, becomes ashes, right? You don't have fire that can burn anything forever. Nothing. There's no such fabric. There's no such chemical. There's no such compound that can be burning forever, right? But this is going to be designed for that, right? There's some kind of body that can withstand the, the fires of the eternal lake, but never be destroyed by that fire kind of new design, new body, right? Things like that. The regenerated in their glorified new bodies will live in the new heaven and new earth. All right, so we also have a new body, not to stand the, the heat of fire, but to have a nose to smell the flowers of the new heaven, new earth, eyes to see the creation, ears to hear the music, and you know, and everything else, right? Of the new heaven and new earth. Just like I got a nose now to smell and eyes to see, but I would presume this would be glorified better, right? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, I'm sorry, uh, an eye and the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised, imperishable, we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, this mortal body must put on immortality. Uh, if you ever conduct a funeral or something we always say you know this body goes in but one day at the last trump when christ comes the trumpet is blown and the ashes the wherever the body that's now become dust become part of the soil become absorbed by the plants into the nutrients to feed the mangoes or whatever or you die in the sea you fed the fish and the fish you know, became fish meal and whatever, all those things are reconstituted, your body will come back again uh, in some amazing way to be a beautiful new body, all right? Cannot, uh, what, quite roughly, what's that body look like? Next slide. We have a little peep of that in Jesus' glorified body. He's the first fruits of it. <clears throat> On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. So in other words, the doors were locked. They didn't unlock the doors. Somehow Jesus in his body, uh, not a spirit, a uh, glorified body. Uh, can I repeat that? Body. Because uh, we always believe the apostles Christ, Christ died bodily and rose bodily. Right? Okay. And that body of his went through somehow the door, the wall, the window, whatever, the roof, I don't know. He just walked right through it. Okay? So it's a body that has new properties, just like the unregenerate body has properties that don't burn out. We have a body that can go through walls, right? Verse 26, eight days later, his disciples were inside and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace, be with you. Well, why do you keep saying peace be with you? Because you're horribly frightening to sit down there with three friends and suddenly a fourth friend appears, you know, and it's enough to make all of us almost faint and die, you know. And uh, Jesus just came right in there and then Jesus said, You can touch me, you know, and so on. So, 
it is a new type of material. I don't know what it is, huh? new type of resurrection, resurrectionium or whatever you want to call it. Huh? Uh, next slide. Mm. The new body of the regenerate is not a spirit, but a body that's adapted to the spirit's control. Now, a lot of times people interpret 1 Corinthians 15.44 and think the new body is a spirit. It's not a spirit, repeat, it's not a spirit. It is so in a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So when people see spiritual body, they think it's a spirit. It's, no, 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 it's a spiritual body. A spirit is no body. <laughs> okay, a spirit is appearance of a body. So what do you mean by spiritual body? It's not a spirit. It's a body adapted to the spirit's control. In other words, a body that is totally under the spirit's control, not the flesh, right? And of course, other properties that I can't describe. We don't know how to describe it, never seen it. If I tell you a new material hasn't been invented, you know, that's stronger than steel, lighter than air, you say, why well, there is such thing? But one day they may invent something like that, right? Like all kinds of new materials are being invented nowadays, right? Next slide. <clears throat> All right, so we will get regenerated in this new body. Where will we stand? We will also have a judgment seat, but it's not called the great white throne. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. To be judged for our sins cannot be. Our sins are already paid by Jesus. He said, it is finished, All right? Which in Greek is, means tetelestai. Tetelestai means fully paid, All right? So why should I stand for my sins again, All right? So for rewards for what they have done, okay? So you're not going to be judged for your sins because that was judged 2,000 years ago on Christ. You're going to be judged for your rewards, okay? Henceforth, there's laid out for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. A okay. crown of righteousness. That's one way to describe it. <clears throat> For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So now they know why it's called the judgment seat of Christ. So then each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So if you did something for the Lord, you'll be blessed. If you did something for your own ego, no rewards, all right? If you have done a lot of preaching every day, you preach every Sunday, you preach, you preach for your own ego, for your own pride, no rewards. Maybe you don't preach terribly well, but you preach for the Lord, you preach for the lost, and then you will get your reward. God will reward you, all right, for what you've done that is good. Good means for the glory of God, all right? So we are going all to stand in judgment seat to you and me, believers but judgment seat of Christ, not to get our punishment, not to pay for our sins, uh, but to get, to be paid for our rewards, right? To be paid for the good deeds that we did in the name of Christ for Christ. Next slide. Okay, so I hope that helps us in individual eschatology because I think a lot of people are not very clear. Right, a lot of if we can explain it very clearly in 10 minutes. We could help a lot of, like, you know, easy. Just now, uh, Evie was telling us about these cancer kids going to die. You know, if a poor cancer kid's going to die, it is no concept that he's going to have a body, he thinks going to float around. It's very scary, it's very unnatural for a kid. It's be quite frightening, quite frightening, you know. You know, when you see pictures of ghosts, they just float around. It's frightening. When Jesus walked through the door, all right, and he didn't say, come touch my hands and all that, they would be kind of terrified. Is this a spirit? Right? And so I hope that we understand that that intermediate state is a very unnatural state. But for most Christians, they think that's the eternal state. For most Christians. Right? They talk about floating in clouds, playing harps, singing hallelujahs, right? So God created man as whole beings. 
When God does something, he does it well. And the goal is he created whole beings on a whole earth, and he's going to restore that again. Okay? Just a newer, better version. He's not going to say, ah, plan A failed. Satan zapped me there, man. I lost. Ah, let me take a plan B. No way. No way is the answer. All right? Satan never got the last word. All right? So share your thoughts about how many percent of Christians believe that after they die, they will forever be spirits. What do you think? I don't know. I've always thought the number is extremely high. I may be wrong. But I think the vast number of majority of Christians think if I die, I'm just going to say bye-bye to my body, never smell a flower, never taste a fish, never do anything again except sing hallelujah on the cloud. Right? Why do so many Christians believe they will be eternal spirits? Though they are taught that Jesus resurrected bodily. Why? All right? And why is it common to correct this common, important to correct this common misconception? What's the benefit? Is it academic? Is it just for us to be smart and dumb? Hey, it's in the immediate state. They say, is it just for that? Would it change our life if we knew the truth? Would it change our life now? All right? I think it will. All right? So share your thoughts. Huh? Just three questions. Straight away, the first one, answer. 90%, that's your answer. No need to discuss too much, right? Then, why? Why, why do you think they believe? 90% believe it's, it's, we are going to be spirits, though we believe Christ rose bodily. And number three, what's a big deal anyway to know this? Okay, so let's take 15 minutes and catch up and chat and uh, discuss this. Yeah. Okay, Maybe this is all the history, lah. Huh? Close in church, blah blah blah. But okay, <clears throat> a lot of it sounds repeat of Ephesians, huh? yeah. <clears throat> so Colossae was a very major city. Now the theme is Jesus is all. You find the word all thirty over times in this short letter. Huh? You read and you underline the alls. You'll be surprised. Sometimes one verse got a few alls, right? Okay, next slide. <clears throat> He's all we need. Huh? He's our creator, redeemer, sustainer, etc. Now. So a few nice verses, like pray for spiritual wisdom and understanding. Huh? So we, that's what we need to pray for. Honestly, as pastors, we need to pray for spiritual wisdom and understanding. Okay. Make this your prayer every day. All right. Working hard is sometimes a horrible death trap for pastors. All right. You need wisdom to know what to do and understanding. All right, next slide. This one is uh, interesting. You pray actually for endurance and patience with joy. Huh? The, the um, people we always think of praying for power and praying for spectacular things. But one of the important things is just this simple uh, hanging in there. Huh? Right, next slide. Now, Jesus is the perfect image of the invisible God, okay? We have not seen God up to this point. Somehow in Revelation 22, it does appear we'll see God. I don't even know how. But up to this point, the only way we can see God, the invisible God, is Christ. Huh? He's a perfect image of the invisible God. Next slide. Now, these few verses are quite mind-boggling to me, huh? For by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So everything that exists was created by him. All right. He's before all things. And in him, all things hold together. He sustains all things. He holds all things together. He created all things. He holds all things together. He's the head of the body, the church is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. He's the beginning of the church, he's everything in the church. Mm, all right. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Wow. In that little body, so to speak, probably the size of the average man, 
all the fullness of God. Lord, I don't even know how. These verses are very hard to grasp, very hard to really fully understand. Through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So he is creator. He is the uh, sustainer. He is the reconciler. He is the beginning of the church. He is the all in all of the church. Wow, everything. Huh? In just few verses, you could hardly wrap your brain around. Okay, but it's worth looking at it every now and then. Next slide. This is uh, the hope of glory. Uh, to them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Similar to Galatians 2.22, Christ lives in you. Huh? Baffling thought, okay? The riches of the glory of the mystery. A mystery is a truth that cannot be believed or known unless God reveals. That's the word mystery, right? The meaning of the word mystery. How can you believe that God lives in you? Impossible. Until God tells you. Right now, you should sit in your chair, you know, in front of Zoom. Can you believe God's living in you? Is it believable? <laughs> <laughs> it's unthinkable, right? <laughs> Even when you tell me God lives in me, I can sit in this chair and zoom and say, how is that possible? Though I heard this truth 40 years ago, I still say, how is that possible? I believe it, but it's so hard to believe it. It's so hard to grasp it, all right? This is the riches of the glory of this mystery, all right? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh -huh. All right, so that's why we can have restfulness. Christ lives in us. He wants us just to do our best. The rest, partner, take over, man. I'm going to sleep. I'm tired. I can't do any more. <laughs> I need to have time to do other things. Take over, <clears throat> all right? Yeah, so things like Okay, this is the interesting part. Huh? So he works in you. This I toil, struggling all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Another strange mystery. I'm supposed to work hard, but he's working in me. All right. Okay, I'm supposed to do my very utmost, and he also does his perfect work in me. Right. So partnering with Christ in us. No need to have too much uh, stress and sleeplessness. No need. Partner will take your slack. If you have a business relationship, you don't have the means, partner takes over. You don't have the, the finances, partner can handle it. That's what a partnership is for, right? Well, you have an amazing partner, relax. Mm. Have a break, right? Mm. Have restlessness, restfulness, I mean, next slide. Uh, this one is another mouthful, huh? all right? It's about how men like to do a lot of quaint things, you know, have saints and have miracle men and have, you know, amazing churches to somehow fill the gap between God and us, right? You see, God is so high, right? So great. That one, I think, we cover our grasp. Everyone, inshallah, no, Allah, Allah Akbar, great God. I think you look at the sky, you know there's a great God. I don't think that's a struggle for most people. But the transcendent high God is also imminent. Huh? So high and so near. Well, this near part is a hard part. So people, when they think about Allah Akbar, so high, then we must have a lot of intermediaries, right? Because it's so high, I'm so small. I need to fill up with saints and feast days and uh, you know church rituals and goodness knows 1,000 things to sort of bring me a little closer to this great God, right? But the Bible tells us Christ is all. Just having Christ. It's all we need. No other intermediaries needed. Christ 
is all. Huh? Okay, <clears throat> but all the rest is you know people like to invent something that you know uh, going to holy land and doing these rituals and you know something or other you know that helps them feel that that brings me a little closer to God. The best way to be close to God is to be close to Christ. Okay, next slide. Similar to Colossians, put on, put off. Huh? Okay, so you'll see that uh, you'll, you'll find uh, uh, the put on and put off in the Ephesians is quite often, and then in this one is uh, also quite often. Huh? It's for example, both Colossians 3 8, put away anger, malice, slander, obscene talk, put off lying, 3 9, 3 10, put on the new man, 3 12. Put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. 314, put on love above all. Huh? So our Christian life is always about, by the grace of God, putting away old habits, old practices, and putting on new ones by the grace of God, by the help of the Holy Spirit. Huh? There's a, we toil to do that, you know, as he toil, as he works in us to put off, put on, put off, put on. Huh? That's basically uh, uh, being taught in Ephesians and Colossians. Yep. Next slide. Rules for the family, very, very similar. Huh? It says, wives submit, husbands love your wives, children obey your parents in the Lord. You know, uh, fathers do not provoke, servants obey your masters. Huh? Exact, almost exactly as Ephesians. Huh? A lot of similarity in Colossians and Ephesians. Probably all wrote it at a similar time. Yeah. This one, I hope people will pray for us. All right. At the same time, pray also for us. This is for people, church members pray that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Now, I wish that our members would pray for clarity because I don't hear a lot of clarity in the pulpit. You hear a lot of good preaching that's not terribly clear. It's a funny thing that a lot of people in the office can be very clear. In fact, if you're not very clear in giving instructions in a theater, in a hospital ward, you'll get scolded and told, come on, be clear. Can you give a clear instruction? You know, that's always... The, 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 the scolding that you get, you know. You kill a patient, you know, you ask for the wrong thing, you ask in a circle, every three seconds counts and then you go round and round, you know. Well, in a theatre, this is the kind of mood that you would have in the theatre. Clarity, man. <clears throat> you want a, you know, a number two suture, ask for a number two suture, you want what, ask for it, okay. But in the pulpit, it's a missing link, almost. All right. I, I, I come up from a sermon almost excited when it's clear, <clears throat> right? When, wow, that truth is made so clear, <laughs> All right? We need prayer. <laughs> it's interesting that Paul, also Paul is saying, please pray, all right, pray for us, that we may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak, all right? Can you imagine Paul struggling with this, all right? And many preachers have never even prayed this prayer, and never, you know, many congregations never prayed this for their, for their pastor. Uh, clarity, man. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> it's like these are gems to me, huh? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, we pray for wisdom and understanding and ask our church, please pray that I can be clear. Okay, Colossians uh, uh, advises that. <clears throat> All right, share how Christians feel to realize Christ is all. I think the theology of it, we do. But in real life, do we realize Christ is all? Are we kind of like not really focusing on Christ? We, we do say Christ is very important and all that. But somehow, we don't really realize how important all right, this Christ is. Okay, Let's say, take 10 minutes, okay? It's, it's a... It's something that we don't need to crack our head. Huh? But have you realized that many Christians don't really see Christ as that vital, right? Okay. Uh, they, they seem to see a lot of important things in, in their theology, in their practice, but not Christ. Yeah. Okay. Take 10 minutes. Mm.
and the slides, useful for teaching your people, you know, uh, uh, about leadership. Number one, very quick review, huh? all of us are made to have, in the image of God, to have dominion over the fish, the sea, etc. So in other words, we all made the image of God, God's a, the ultimate leader, we are made to lead, have dominion over the world. All right, God could have sent angels here. Did he put this fellow here to lead? All right, in fact. Okay, so our job is to lead, work hard and lead. All right, next slide. So last week we did the things, huh? Okay, you perceive a need, whatever that need is, you know, hunger, a lonely widow, you possess a gift, you can encourage her, you can talk, you got something, you have a gift, all right? You create a passion, you tell everybody in the church, hey, we got to take care of widows. All right, then you pursue the people, then you soon have a ministry for the neglected or the widows, whatever. And then it becomes, you have, you're effectively led a new ministry, right? Whatever you perceive a need in your church, I don't know what, what, what is that need. Maybe, oh, we, we've got kids who can play basketball. You know, we can reach out to the kids who are bored out of school year that you perceive a need. Then you can play basketball, right? Then you parade a passion. Then a few basketballers join your, your team. Then you pursue them to form a little organization and then bang, you have a ministry. That's what, how leadership is. Huh? Basically, that's what it is. Next slide. All right. Today, we're talking more about the heart of a leader. Those were the techniques. That was the process. All right. Today is the heart. Okay. What makes you a leader? People want to follow. That's basically what it is. your heart. All right. So let's look at the slide. The heart is the foundation. Okay. A good leader has the right heart, I would say. The right character, maybe that would be a good word. All right? Then, with that right character, you build your skills, your leadership skills, your people skills, your project management skills. That's the building. The foundation is your character. People follow you not because you have skills. You got skills, they follow you for a while, they walk off because they find your character shaky. Right? So, Foundation is character. Why do people follow someone? Why do some people have a lot of followers? They trust the foundation, right? Next slide. So, natural tendency for most people is you tend to work on the building, on the skills, the competencies, you know? You tend to work on the project rather than to work on your character, right? And this is where we fail. We, any good builder knows you get the right foundation, you can build any building, high, 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 also can, right? If your foundation is not good, you build a building, looks very good after a while, starts to tilt, starts to crack, and then it comes down. Bye-bye to your leadership, everybody left you. All right, next slide. So, there are many things, huh? so I'm just gonna run through them. This is, again, John Maxwell, very, very uh, useful. You, you just tick, 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 and, and you have the slides, you go back and look at it. Huh? A great purpose in life. Mm. Okay? So a leader always has a very clear purpose. People can see he is headed for that. People don't want to follow a guy who's lost himself, right? This guy's got a clear purpose. He has a burden for basketball players, you know? He has a burden for widows, okay? That's what he talks about. You can see that's where he's going to really, you follow him, chances are he's going to get there to the top of the mountain of uh, basketball or, or widow's ministry or whatever. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Then number two is he's removed hindrances. Right? Next slide. Mm -hmm. Okay. You don't want to follow a guy who seems to be burdened with a lot of things. He's talking about widows and then he's playing with his cell phone and he's, you know, when you want to do a ministry, he's looking for the nicest restaurant, you know, he's out cycling for five hours. You know what I mean? It's like, hey man, are you serious or not? <laughs> okay, your talk is very serious, but your life seems all diverted all over the place, all right? So generally people follow a leader, they see the purpose, they see the focus, all right? Next slide. So they, these are people who can drop unnecessary baggage. You know, a lot of things, they just drop it off. Huh? Okay, mm, next slide. Then this person is wanting to serve God. It's very clear. Are you you're scared to help work with a leader who is actually serving himself? He's pretending to serve God, but actually there's a lot of hidden agenda. Right, next slide. Mm. 
right? So this person is absolutely focused, right? And you can see that his only goal is God's glory, not my credibility, you know, become more famous, you know, or you want to help somebody whose ego? I don't think so. Mm, next slide. So you know this guy is serving God, not self. Mm, next slide. Then you wouldn't want to follow a guy who is just all energy. And after a while, you know, it's not going to last very long. His energy will run out and the work won't really go. Huh? So somebody who is prayerful, you know that this guy is probably going to do something significant, lasting, things like Okay, So you can't rise higher than your prayer life. You may have all the other characters, your prayer life is, okay, you're going to be a shaky leader. Huh? And people will see it, smell it, and will run off from you. Next slide. Okay. Next one is, you must know the word of God. People don't follow you because you know the latest John Maxwell theology, uh, uh, principles, John Maxwell's program, you know, you read all the good books. If you don't know the word of God, all right, next slide, you will see what will happen. When things don't go according to plan, you probably will surrender. All right? But if you know the word of God, you know it is according to the will of God. You know, you know according to the character of God allows us to fail, God allows us to go through ups and downs. But I know God wants me to do this, I will do it. Then you will probably have a leader with followers because they know it's not a whim, it's not a, a, a new fad, you know. He is led by God's word to do this kind of stuff. Next slide. Then you don't want to follow a leader who is just doing social work. You don't mind doing a lot of work, you know, build bridge building and feeding and all that, but it must be more than just helping people survive this world in 70 years on this earth, right? It must be a life changing message that really changes them, not we just feed them or, or encourage widows, but that must be the, the, the great message of the gospel in it. Otherwise, for what? Are we a social work? You know, uh, there's so many social organizations that run things better than we can in the church. Next slide. So everything must lead people to Christ, right? To Christ like this. Otherwise, they're just, you know, a, a, a social work that, you know, doesn't last at all. Next slide. Then the leader must have faith. You find some leaders somehow keep getting shaken. Right? <laughs> He's not even confident that God's with him. He's not even confident that if things go up and down, you know, he is in the will of God and God will see him through and God will provide. You know, oh, I'm a bit nervous to follow a leader who is shaky. Huh? All right. Uh, so someone who has the, the faith to believe huh? that this is God's work. God will provide. God will see me through. All right. So... Next slide, please. Uh, a leader who gets to action. Nobody wants to follow a NATO leader. Talk, 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 meeting after meeting, nothing happens. <laughs> okay. Okay, this guy is a good talker. I mean, this guy can really sell a project, but do I want to follow this guy? I may end up just talking and talking and game, right? So, next slide. So, you have to be. Uh, a servant, start going out, try, work, all right, give it a go, man, all right, dirty your hands, you know, and maybe get embarrassed with some failures too, next slide. So you need to be proactive, willing to just get out there and get going. Okay. Many have all the other characters, but not proactive. Very good at running meetings. After a while, not many people will follow you. And number nine, a leader who is using his gifts and who's helping you discover your gifts. Wow. That's very important. Okay. Some leaders are not even sure of their gifts and never really are interested in other people's gifts. They just want to have some work done, just some activity, some ministry, some program going. Wow. All right. So, 
there are a lot of people like that. Okay, next slide. So you must know your primary gift, maybe one gift, two gifts. What are you good at? Are you developing it? Are you helping others discover their gift? Helping them develop it? Wow! When you are that kind of leader who is helping people discover it, helping them develop, they will stay with you because they're growing. They're getting excited that gift is being used. When you have a gift, you do something, you enjoy it, you see it successful, others see it successful, it's kind of like self-motivating when you're using it. If it's not your gift, it's hard. It's drudgery, right? Huh? So are you a person who can very clearly discern your own gift, develop it and discern other people's gifts? You are not. People work for you what? As a robot? As an extra pair of hands? Huh? Right? They're not developing. Right? So a lot of leaders don't even know their own gift. How can they help anyone discover gifts? They're not even aware this thing is a big deal. Next slide. A leader is secure enough to empower others. Now, many leaders are insecure. Right? This is a sad thing, but a very real problem. Now, if you ask people, are you secure or not secure? The answer is, Pastor, I'm not insecure. Lah. You know, I'm a secure leader. But you can ask yourself some more probing questions. Next slide. Right? Mm. Classic case is Jesus. Huh? Jesus is so secure. Last night, he washed feet, right? Knowing he's the son of God, he's willing to do the lowest job. Why? Totally secure. Totally confident his 12 will do better than him. All right. Wow. How many leaders are saying, ah, I've trained people and I believe their potential to do better than me. I'm willing to step down, step back and let them run. Who am I anyway? All right. Okay. Next slide. Mm. Test yourself. Are you one of the secure leaders? Very simple. Check this. Are you a delegator or you tend to hold things a lot? You tend never to delegate. You're bottlenecking a lot of stuff. Well, subconsciously, you're insecure. You're holding things in case you don't, you become jobless one day. You become less relevant. You become less needed. Insecure guy. Next one. Are you actively looking for talent? Wow. If you say, Pastor, I'm not insecure, but I have never actively looked for talent. You're insecure. <laughs> okay. I can tell you this is a very probing. Checklist. Are you planning for your disciples to do better than you? Telling people, yes, they can do better than me. Planning for them to do better and expecting them to do better and telling people they can do better than you? If you're not, you're probably insecure. All right? Okay? So, good, good uh, task. I'm not saying it's a foolproof test, but it's a very probing. It's like MRI or an x-ray, it can tell you a lot inside. Not 100%, but pretty accurate. Okay, so this one is a very important one. It's probably one of the more common problems we all have. Okay, wanting to be the big guy, wanting to be the one really needed, you know, the one, the go-to guy for everything, right? It's like, Leader lives under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. How do you know that? People can see. People can smell. Somehow, his works seem to have the hand of God on it. He starts something, it's not always uh, dying, dragging. You know, next slide? Let's do the next slide. Yeah. Are you seeing God's hand on your ministry? Are others seeing God's hand on your ministry? What do you mean by God's hand? It's like, I'm not that smart. I don't have that much experience. This ministry is pretty new. But you know what? I'm surprised how God brings in all these people. My helpers. Wow. It must be the hand of God that brings them in. I'm surprised. All right. God brings in these resources. I, I, it takes me by surprise. It's beyond 
myself, beyond my abilities, well, you tend to see something that encourages you a lot. I'm not saying all the time, but this one, very powerful. When people see that, people want to always like to go on a winning team. People want to go on God's team. And they see God's hand on you, they will join you. They will want to be with a leader who somehow seems to have the hand of God on him. Okay, it's a bit harder to, 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 to you know, specify, huh? right? Next slide. And then the leader has chosen to be an example before he leads, okay? So this kind of leader is, all right, he is willing to do the job. I'm not saying you always have to do it. The example, not to be a worker. Always no different. Chosen to be an example. If you're always working, then you're not leading. That's the truth. But you're willing to be an example. To help people kick off. To be the role model for it. And when needed, just come right in. Roll your sleeves up and do it. But your job is still as a leader. All right? So, setting that exam. Next slide. All right. The most effective way to lead, disciple others. So, this is actually a discipling process. Role modeling processes. You want people in the church to do certain things as a pastor? You just do it. All right? You example it. You can preach it from the pulpit with the best sermon. It's not as powerful as after the preaching you go down. And then for years after that, you example it, that message will stick. That message will transform lives. You start with a message and then you just leave it as a message. It's forgotten that by next week, middle of the week, they forget what you said then. All right? Next slide. So, people follow leaders whom they trust, trust to be men who know the word of God, men of faith, all right, men of who are servants, men of good examples, you know, they trust the person because they know about that guy, that's that, I trust he's a leader worth following, I trust he's the right kind of guy, you know, the word trust here is big, you know? It's not like just, oh, you believe me? Yeah, I believe. It's, it's something deep, right? And what builds a trust? His character. All those things you mentioned, you know? All those little things. You add that all up, it builds trust. The person sees these things in our life and says, wow, I want to follow this guy. Right? His ministry? I'm willing to serve it. All right. And then not only that, you will volunteer other people to come in and join you because you have his trust and you have his respect. All right. Wow. When you reach that stage of leadership, you know, it always scares me to hear this. Many times in church, people say, Pastor, this, this ministry I cannot find enough workers. Now, sometimes it's because the person is new. We understand that. Sometimes it's a transition. But if a person's been there for years and always struggling to get the workers, the donations, or whatever, you begin to wonder, is this person building trust and respect? Or is it year in, year out? People wait for him to ask and they give a few excuses. Maybe they come one, two times and run away. And it's perpetually short of workers. Then you begin to wonder, right? People are not following this guy. They don't trust him. They don't respect him. Next time. So, godly character builds. Strong teams, big teams, lasting teams that change the world. Basically, that's what it is. What's a leader? A guy with followers. How do you have a lot of followers? A lot of trust and respect. And we have a team like that, you will change the world. Okay? Next slide. I'm simplifying things, huh? but, but basically, it's what it is, right? So, today, let's ask ourselves, let's share some activities, some disciplines, you can apply your life in order to develop a stronger character. It could be your prayer life. Maybe terrible. Maybe you understand the word is everybody look at you, it's like is this guy serious, right? All right. 
ask yourself, what could you do to build right, that trust, that character that people will trust? Like any foundation, it didn't happen. Foundations are built. Foundations can be strengthened. All right. How do you strengthen your character, your leadership character? All right. So the 12 things here, you know, maybe go to your slides. I think have the slides been sent to you? All right. <clears throat> and you ask yourself, which of these 12 or so that I need to start working on? It's obviously, maybe I'm a talker, talker, talker. I never have the guts to start something. Hmm, maybe people watch me like huh, another one of those, you know. Uh, so I don't know. Each of you will have a different area where you can start uh, building on. Something's harder, like the hand of God on you. And what can you do about that? <laughs> All right. So of course that one you can't start with and build uh, activities to get the hand of God on you, right? But others you can. Okay. Like maybe if too many hindrances, you're carrying too much distractions and people watch your lives like, don't you want to follow this guy? He's so busy with his hobbies. His life is like one bundle of hobbies. Let him do his hobbies, huh? right? Is he really having a purpose? Is he really serious? You know? So you need to, do I need to drop some of these things? Mm. Okay, so let's take maybe 15 minutes. Yeah. Let's take 15 minutes and work on this area of uh, your own self, what in your view, you know, these 12 things that uh, that we brought up, yeah, yeah, okay. If you don't can't remember the 12 things, go to your notes and have a look at them, yeah, okay, yeah.